you. Um, thanks everyone and great to be here. Um, just to introduce myself first, uh, my name is Hannah Batram. I work for Global Action Plan. So we're a um, charity that focuses largely on air quality for those of you that don't know and our kind of overall um, aim as a charity is to mobilize uh, kind of actions on the systems that harm us and our planet. So um, my background is as a secondary school teacher um, and I've also spent about 10 years kind of running programs um, in schools and uh, with young people in, in general. So some of those have been in out of school context as well. And today I just wanted to give a bit of an overview on uh, two particular kind of air quality programs that um, I've run, give you a bit of an overview and some of the learnings on, on those. And some of those actually will really echo some of the things that um, Clive has been mentioning. So I'll I'll probably uh, skip, skim over some of those because he's 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 done my my hard work for me. Um, but also just to to kind of give you a bit of an overview of of some of the things that um, I've learned more generally over the last kind of fifteen ish years working um, either in schools or directly with them. So um, the two programs that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, are at very, very different scales. And um, the first one is a, a kind of really in-depth program that I ran over the course of a year in with three schools in Lambeth with a kind of multidisciplinary team. And the other one um, is an international campaign, um, which was working with partners across the world um, and the United Nations Com uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child. So starting with the um, Lambeth Schools Air Quality Programme, just to give you a little bit of a, an overview of kind of what that was about. That was a um, multidisciplinary team with the, the kind of um, the various groups that are, are kind of identified below. And the main aims um, was to essentially build an understanding of what factors are actually affecting air pollution in schools to put some technical and behavioral solutions in those three schools with the funding and everything to, to be able to actually implement them um, and then ensure that their scalability. So instead of just, you know, doing this um, project with these three schools, making sure that learnings and resources and, and other sort of things are um, realized and available to other schools in the UK. So the team that I mentioned, we had Impact on Urban Health, who are the program funder, um, Global Action Plan, which was my main role in this, was we were supporting on the behavioural intervention. So working with things like the Eco Council and the, the teachers and um, the various operational staff at the school um, and the overall program management. Arup were looking at kind of giving that more um, specialist technical advice and supporting with designing and implementing those kind of physical interventions. Um, and the University of Surrey were doing air quality measurements and that was actually kind of uh, put together in, a, in an academic research paper which was um, published quite recently. So in terms of, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of the um, results, we, as I mentioned, we worked with three Lambeth schools and you'll see from the, the dates here, September 2020 to 2021, it was actually during um, some of the kind of height of that, that pandemic, which caused various delays, but that's, that's obviously not the, the purpose of, of kind of today's presentation. Um, we implemented a combination of 22 different interventions across the three schools. So that was a mixture of kind of behavior change um, campaigns that were run by the students as well as technical interventions. So um, things like putting in green screens and air um, cleaning devices in the schools. Um, and essentially um, the, the project as a whole kind of improved air quality and the individual's knowledge, which it, at the end of the day helped um, support the health of over 700 children across those kind of three schools. Um, the outputs that we had from them, we had um, a school street in one of the um, the schools that, that was put in on a, um, a kind of temporary basis. So it was, it was as part of car free day. Um, and this was kind of the um, is included in the research paper that I mentioned from University of Surrey. So they measured that they that putting in that school street has a 36 um, had a 36 percent reduction in particulate matter in and around the school, which is obviously um, a huge reduction. You know, a third over a third of that uh, that kind of really harmful um, particulate matter was obviously not affecting the, the children in the same way that it had done. 
um, repairing windows at one of the schools improved the ventilation rates by up to 40% so that we were finding that there was a real buildup of carbon dioxide in the um, room. So just being able to kind of have operational windows really improved that, that ventilation. Um, there are of course kind of points around, you know, opening windows onto busy roads and stuff which are, have, have been mentioned briefly already um, that have to be borne in mind but obviously um, if you know if you've got schools where the windows can be opened at certain times of the day um, that that's a huge reduction and really helps with kind of concentration and various other uh, benefits. We put some air cleaning devices in one school where there um, that was adjacent to a very, very busy road. So there wasn't other kind of solutions available. Um, and that reduced particular matter down by 57% with that particular kind of setup. Um, and there was also a green screen, which was installed at uh, the boundary of, of another school that we worked with, which reduced um, particulate meta getting in from a, the sort of busy road um, into the school playground by up to 44%. So some really um, kind of concrete findings there. Um, and I mentioned that we wanted to make sure that the, those outputs were kind of scalable. So we created um, through the sort of work that we did, we did a lot of work with the students as well to do things like active travel campaigns and they created low pollution maps and various other sorts of um, curriculum linked um, education sort of initiatives. And um, we created those and made those freely accessible online through our uh, Transform Our World um, kind of uh, teacher portal. We also, um, I mentioned there was a peer academic uh, research public, published by the University of Surrey. So um, that was available, that's available kind of for all to read the, the detail. And we've summarized those in those case study sort of snippets that I just uh, shared with you. Um, we also updated, we have a, a tool, an online tool, which has been kind of um, put together with the University of Manchester and, and head teachers and various other kind of stakeholders. And we updated that to make sure that all of the learnings were included within that. And Arup also um, created a, an air quality um, toolkit for schools to use to show sort of some of the different pros and cons of different um, interventions. Um, again, all of this is, is freely accessible on um, the Transform Our World website, and we also created the case studies that I mentioned. So quite a, a kind of in-depth project over the course of the year, really supporting the schools on those kind of bespoke actions. Um, and like I said, that that's scale of that project was quite in, in, um, in depth, and it was working with you know, multiple stakeholders, um, including, you know, the local council um, that we had to liaise with, of course, to, to try and get things like uh, school streets and school uh, road closures and stuff agreed. So in terms of kind of key lessons learned, some of these um, may seem obvious, but I think then they're important to draw out because they're not always considered as part of that sort of process. Um, the first one is just making sure that all the stakeholders are, are really sort of consulted and, and um, involved as part of that decision making process, because, you know, if there are things that you want to implement, but it needs, you know, council approval or it needs to be delivered within a specific time frame, actually, that can be really, really um, challenging. Um, if those stakeholders are, are not uh, involved or even within the project team, making sure that, you know, the project team actually sort of understand each other's um, priorities and timescales and, you know, all of those are other, other kind of important um, points. Um, making sure that there's time and I would suggest for a project like this kind of quite a lot of time so between six to 12 months to sort of scope out you know the project setup make sure that make it to make sure that those maximum benefits can be realized um, and make the best use of the resources so um, what I mean by that is if you need to get things like um, let's say if it was a school street for example but the council um, aren't able to do that in that particular time frame actually just understanding what those barriers are and 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 how when they might fit in best can can actually mean that you really realize the benefits um, much in a much greater way um, if you've got kind of funding and, and so on available to, to do some of these, um, to put some of these interventions in place. Um, the other thing is uh, where it's relevant, obviously in a, in a kind of project like this, actually we, on reflection, we thought that it would have 
probably worked a little bit better if we had a kind of temporary part-time role that was obviously paid for through the project um, to act as the project manager that was within the school on a, on a weekly basis. So whilst we were going into the school regularly, it was just to try to reduce those kind of pressures on the school. If you're actually kind of embedded within the school setup and, you know, I could go and speak to, I don't know, the caretaker or the, the, the site manager or the business manager or whoever it might be that I needed to speak to to get something in place, that would reduce that pressure on um, the head teacher who was my main point of contact to, to have to kind of set those meetings up or pass on that information to the relevant person and, and kind of put me in touch each time if, if I was actually on site. Obviously, that's not going to be practical in every single school, but it's just something to consider as and where, it, uh, as and where it's relevant, basically. Um, so that's the um, bit of an overview of the first project. The second one is completely different. Um, this one it was called Freedom to Breathe and it was an international campaign. Um, so completely different setup, completely different scale and completely different uh, kind of, I guess, level of intervention. Um, so this one, we were working with partners across, um, across the world. So Blue Air uh, were the funder on this one. Um, and then we were working with partners in India, USA, um, China and uh, the Cameroon. And we were the, the partner in, in the UK. So each of those, um, those partners in the different parts of, of the world, um, we, were, we put together a kind of education programme which was empowering and educating children to call on the United Nations Committee of the Rights of the Child um, to call for a right to clean air to actually be included, which at the moment it's it's not. So children have a right to, um, you know, a, an education, they have a right to, uh, to, to play and various other things, but they don't actually have a right to um, clean air. And we know, especially amongst this group, that um, the children are disproportionately affected by the, the harms of kind of breathing in um, polluted air. So th those calls we had um, across the globe, we had over 29,000 children who made that call to the UN um, CRC. That was supported by um, 62 signatories. So that was from businesses and civil society organizations from across the world. And we also had kind of a white paper and communications. And um, you'll see the, the kind of bottom left here, um, that was an online event where the children actually presented to the vice chair of the Committee on the Rights of the Child, to Mr. Um, Philip Jaffe, um, and raised their voices and raised their concerns essentially, and shared their stories about how um, you know, polluted air was affecting them and why they wanted it to be included. So um, off the back of that, Mr. Jaffe did actually acknowledge that children should have a right to clean air, um, and it got quite kind of wide uh, you know, attention across various sort of media outlets. And the next phase, which we're in at the moment, is to actually um, campaign for that right to be included within the, the UNCRC. So it was acknowledged that it should be in there, but it's still not actually been included. And at the moment, we're working on um, something called General Comment 26, which is a um, United Nations kind of committee on the rights of the child consultation process, which is focusing on the environment and it has a special focus on climate change. Um, the UNCRC are inviting uh, children from around the world and um, civil society organizations to feed into that. So I would really actively encourage, you know, um, as organizations, as academics, as, um, you know, people working with schools or who have links to schools to, to kind of promote um, this and, and make sure that children's rights are elevated and heard. Because in a, in a nutshell, what this will do is um, create that kind of a, a new right, which will then be able to hold governments and, and officials to account and actually might uh, then put people across the world in a position to, to say, you know, children should have a right to clean air and obviously lots of other environmental uh, issues that are very salient as, as well. Um, but uh, it will give that power to citizens and to organisations to, to call for those rights. So in the same way that you could say, you know, why is this child not going to school? Every child has a right to an education. Um, that's the kind of power that it will provide to citizens and it will start to, to kind of hold governments much more accountable um, for those 
yeah, to, to, to realize those rights essentially. So um, in terms of kind of key lessons from working in a global context um, is that whilst we were working on a global scale, having the local expertise in each of those different places was absolutely critical. And particularly if you think about, you know, places like um, China and how to approach kind of um, the, the education system within the, the, the sort of government setup that's there was very different to working, for example, in the USA um, and like places like India and, and Cameroon had very, very different challenges as well. So having that kind of like local expertise was really, really critical. Um, they had, the schools had, you know, have such huge variety of, um, I, I guess, challenges that they face in different parts of the world, but also, uh, you know, particularly in the context of air quality, that obviously varies hugely around the world. So understanding how to, to approach those schools was, was really key. Um, and obviously, air, not obviously, but air quality is perceived very differently in different parts of the world. So it has to be communicated in a way that's that's really well received. So that local expertise um, and knowledge, both the schools and kind of curriculum messaging and wider communications was really, really essential. Um, so that's that's to give you sort of a bit of an overview of the, the Freedom to Breathe and Lambeth projects and just some uh, kind of common themes and, and learnings um, just from working in schools, as I said, both on, on sort of the inside and, and going into schools more generally. Um, the first one, I think um, uh, Clive has, has mentioned a lot of um, during his, his presentation, so I'm, I'm glad that, that my, uh, my thoughts uh, kind of echo those, but it's really, really having to recognise that the, the pressures that schools face, so the staff time, the physical resources, the financial pressures that they're under, so doing everything that you can to make it easy, to add value, and to really recognise and appreciate what their context is. So in the, in the kind of clean air um, context, one thing to really draw out is at the moment, there is no specific mandate for schools to act on air pollution. If you think about things like safeguarding, they have a specific mandate to do that. They don't have that mandate to act on air pollution. So there has to be sort of some added value and it has to be easy for them to implement um, and ideally kind of free of charge or very, very minimal cost, if any at all. Um, because there is no central funding to support schools to take action as far as I'm aware at, at this point in, in time. Um, the other thing if you're working with schools is kind of considering that measurement and evaluation uh, piece more broadly and that's to help both in terms of the, the sort of communication and schools recruitment. So Clive mentioned having you know those those kind of head teachers or that act essentially as Trojan horses and, and are communicating and helping you to, to highlight the benefits, actually having that is it can be really, really powerful to, to bring other schools on board and sort of get the momentum there. Um, but also to kind of help raise schools' voices in campaigns. So making sure that, you know, those voices are heard at a wider sort of systemic level if you're in a position where you're sort of collecting lots of information from lots of different schools, that can really, you know, actually elevating those voices can, can um, help bring about change and, and highlight some of the issues that, that are around essentially. And communication is key. So being kind of consistent, persistent and patient because of those pressures. And, you know, Clive kind of mentioned, you know, just little and often. And I think that's, that's, that's really um, that's really right. And being really clear on the offer and the, the benefits, you know, what's the research behind it? Why, why does the school need to do this, particularly given the, the kind of limited time and so on that they have? And really leveraging your networks and, and multiple stakeholders. So, you know, if you're not able to, the, the head teacher or, or the science lead or whoever it might be in that school might receive hundreds of emails you know, each week or each day sometimes. But if you've got a contact who works in the local council or or through the, um, you know, the unions or through a, a governor who works there and kind of taking that pressure off those individual teachers can can be a really great um, way to try to, to work with that school and, and sort of have your point heard. Um, and I'm just going to just elaborate very quickly on what I mean by adding value, because I think that means different things to different people. In a school context, what I'm talking about here is um, kind of different points of, around adding value. So 
the sort of education side and the curriculum points and having that student involvement or the parents and families involvement where perhaps parents and families can actually support um, an initiative that you're running so it takes that load off of the, the school staff. Um, being able to actually support something that's going to improve the school infrastructure or the resource within the school um, to take that kind of financial pressure off, giving that technical expertise that the school might not have. They might you know, have a great willingness to, to want to do something, but actually if they're not sure what the, the, the right intervention is or, um, or where they should go to it, actually helping to provide that can, can really, really help. Um, involving that wider community where it's relevant. So obviously, um, if there are benefits to the wider community and the wider school community can help, then bring them on board. Obviously, this is where it's, it's relevant, um, but also kind of really recognising what, you know, pollution sources and what level of control the school has to influence some of these things. So if you've got, you know, a very, very busy road, a factory right next to the school and you're, you're you know, you're running a campaign about opening windows, you kind of need to think about how to position that and actually maybe that might be um, better place to, to work and support the school to, to tackle kind of pollution at, at source um, so that they can open windows, but also they're not getting this huge influx of, of pollutants from outside. So um, I'm going to stop there. Um, and. In